We decided to have Mark Schultz this year as our guest of honor because he was available. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I'm, I'm a cheap date. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Uh, some years ago, when I was editing the Wandering Star books, Marcelo and I were talking about you know what's coming next, and we, we Marcelo had a definite plan for when Conan was coming along, and he said, "Yeah, I've got this artist in mind, uh, a guy named." He said, "Mark Schultz, you know him." I'm like, uh, and at the time, I didn't. Marcelo said, uh, "He's really great. He's a cross between Frazetta and Al Williams." <laughs> I'm like, "Oh, sure." And he sent me a copy of Cadillacs. Right? Cadillacs and dinosaurs. And, dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. and I was just <coughs> absolutely, as they say, gobsmacked. It was a cross between Frazetta and Al Williamson. Um, and so Mark got the got the call to do the first Conan book for Wandering Star and, and then of course went into Del Rey. And if you've seen that, you know what lovely work he does. But particularly wanted Mark this year because Mark's also got a toe in the Lovecraftian kind of stuff. If you saw his illustrations, he he can do a, a Lovecraftian beastie as well as anybody. You heard uh, Jeff and Mark <coughs> talking about that this morning, Scott talking about this that this morning, the uh, visualizing of some of those cosmic entities. <laughs> so I'm just gonna sit up here and, and toss Mark a couple of softballs to get us started, and then if, if people have more compelling questions they want to ask of him. Um, anybody here familiar with Mark's work other than the Conan book? Yeah. Okay. Great. That's good. Sounds um, good. I guess I should stand up, too, because I can't see the people in the back. So. Yeah. It, does that one work, too? Can you hear me? Yes. Good? I'll keep it off until. Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe we ought to just toss this yeah. back. Yeah, and forth. You okay. Yeah, yeah, that that was was turn, turn that one off. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, let's just start with you get the. Uh, did, how did Marcelo get in touch with you? I, I'm thinking this was about 2000. I'm trying to remember the exact date. It's out there. But Gary Gianni, who's a friend of mine, who's an illustrator and a comic book artist as well, had been doing. He did the Solomon, the first Wandering Star book, the Solomon Kane book, did a beautiful job on that. And I believe he had taken on the Bran McMorn uh, book by then as well. And I believe Marcel had asked him if he was interested in doing Conan. And uh, not being, I guess, the best businessman in the world, Gary said he'd pass on Conan <laughs> <laughs> in favor of the breakout star Bran McMorn. And uh, <coughs> which I, it was a, you know, it was a great, he, he was able to put his own element into that. Get a little closer there. A little closer, is that better? And uh, so uh, he recommended me. Marcel was aware of my work, and, and Gary knew that I had a great deal of affection for Howard's work. So he recommended me to Marcel, and Marcel got in touch with me, and I, I jumped at the chance. So that was, that was the beginning of things. And, and at the time, uh, Marcel had hoped that one illustrator would do all three volumes of the projected Conan. And, uh, and I, I couldn't take on all three jobs. And I think it's just as well, because Gary did take on the second book and, and did his own version of Conan. And then, of course, uh, Greg Manchez did the third, ver uh, third volume. And I think there are three, it's nice to have three different visions uh, of those stories. That was something Marcel and I discussed, and, and we thought it came out great to, to sort of illustrate the idea that there's no correct way to depict Conan. It's the way the artist sees it. Um, what was it like to work with Marcelo as an art director? Uh, guys, we, I think we need to turn the volume up. Yeah, is there a volume in the back? Nobody can turn um, the back, the very back. I, I don't have any idea. Um, <coughs> yeah, the volume is really weird. Yeah, yeah, I know that. I think they got two, two mics stuck in. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, it looks like we got a reaction in the back, so. All right. 
Okay. Was I answering a question? Yes, you were answering the question about working with Marcelo as an art director. Rusty had asked me what it was like to work with Marcelo Anciano. Um, uh, he was both the, the art director and uh, he was very involved. He wasn't the designer of the book, but he had a very clear idea of what he wanted the book to look like. And I, I had ideas too, and we agreed upon a, a very uh, specific format for every story where uh, there would be, every story would start with a little illustration across the top title, and there would be a full page illustration within the story, and then there'd be a little tag at the end of every story. And I like the formality of that, and he did too. We didn't have to go that direction. Other artists uh, chose to do more um, a free format, you know, finding illustrations that fit in different formats throughout the story. But I like the formality of every story. I can't remember him ever saying, I don't like this, redo it. We had some discussions on what angles to take on things, what, um, what was appropriate, uh, any number of illustrations you could do for any story, which would be the best illustrations to, to, uh, to punctuate the story, to, uh, to, to augment the story. And uh, you know, he was great to work with, very agreeable. I've got, I've got no horrible stories about Marcel <laughs> Anziano. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's go to the obvious, which is uh, tell us about the development of Mark Schultz as an artist. <coughs> when did you start? Uh, do you remember ever starting? Did you, or were you just drawing and you were yeah. pre-memory? Well, I think it's typical for, you'll hear this story from any number of illustrators or artists, but I can remember when I was five years old drawing little those little tin watercolor sets you would get at the kitchen table. But I was drawing dinosaurs, and when I saw books of dinosaurs, that kind of blew my head apart and changed the, it went from drawing pictures of the family and the dog and, and, and landscapes that I wanted to do dinosaurs and monsters. And so it wasn't a far leap from that. As I got a few years older, I think I discovered Edgar Rice Burroughs when I was eight. Via first was the motion pictures, the Johnny Weissmuller pictures, but that led me to the actual novel Tarzan and then Oh boy, about when I was 13, I think, my interest in Burroughs led me to, to uh, Howard. And, uh, and that, uh, as much as I love Burroughs, and I do very much, there's a, there's a level of depth to Burroughs you don't go past, but Howard is just, uh, there's so many levels to his work that it makes it uh, something that I go back and reread every few years, and not only do I get a different take on his stories, but I get different ideas about how I'd like to illustrate them. So there's a lot of richness to his stuff, but it was a progression. And, uh, and Lovecraft works in there too, as you mentioned, but uh, Howard and Lovecraft are kind of, uh, for me, even though they, they wrote different type of stories, even though they, they had, uh, well, they, they were different genres, they were still genres, but they're different genres. There's still a, a core central view of life in the 20th century as returning from a, a supernatural understanding of the universe to a scientific uh, understanding of the universe that fascinates me that these guys were wrestling with that in their in their fiction and for me that's uh, I've got a great deal of interest in that and that carries more than just the surface the fact that there's a cool barbarian guy fighting monsters and stuff and half naked women that's great but there's a lot more depth they can extract from his work talk a little bit about your uh, training and influences talk about my influences training and influences. training well I went to school for fine art at Kutztown State University in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, I grew up wanting to be a comic book artist and illustrator when I got to college and I got my head turned around and decided I was gonna be a fine artist. And that lasted about eight, 10 years before I figured out that what I really was interested in was story. And that led me back to comics and illustration. Comics being an actual storytelling medium and illustration being the, um, the augmentation uh, the implication of story that accompanies a story. And so I love both aspects of that, but my, in, my influences extend back to the 19th century guys like Winslow Homer, who inspired the early 20th century illustrators like uh, Howard Pyle, N.C. Wyeth, Dean Cornwell, and of course all those guys inspired the guys that I saw as a kid on paperback covers, most importantly Frazetta, but also the comic book artists like Al Williamson, Rusty had mentioned earlier, and, and Bollywood. Uh, it all comes out of an early 20th century American illustrator uh, school. And, uh, 
And that's one reason I think Marcel was interested in our type of work, Gary's and mine, and Greg Manchester's for these books, is because our uh, influences harken back to those days, and it's more period appropriate for the type of writing that Howard does. Um, the, the type of illustration I do in a broader sense of contemporary illustration is considered old fashioned, but within uh, various niche markets like this, it's, it's the right thing. And hopefully people see it as a kind of a classic, uh, a classic influence in it that is going to work now. It worked when it was done in the 20s, when it was first conceived in the 20s, it works now and it'll work 100 years or 200 years from now. That's, that's the hope anyway. <laughs> Um, when did you start on Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, that whole world? Okay. Rusty is referring to Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, which is actually the, uh, <clears throat> the media, the big media name for Xenozoic Tale, which was a book I started in 1986 as a creator-owned property, a comic book. Uh, it was my entrance, it was my gateway into comics, and uh, it was reasonably successful. It got turned into a television show, an animated television show on CBS. Uh, enough to be on one season, so it wasn't an overwhelming success. It wasn't Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is kind of eternal. It did well for one year, but that was it. But that opened the, the door for so many other things for me. And, and my interest in it, Xenozoic Tales is a, it's a futuristic fantasy, science fiction, cautionary tale that's very influenced by my love of Edgar Rice Burroughs, and King Kong, and, and Edgar, um, I'm sorry, Robert E. Howard. A lot of the writing influence goes into it and the illustration influences that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but I started that in 1986 and I kept doing that through the mid 90s and I had to kind of drop it in favor of other things. But I am, uh, my next personal project that I'm just starting now is to get back into the new Cenozoic. It'll be a graphic novel, it'll be a 60 page story, minimum of 60 pages, but fingers crossed that I'll get that done in two or three years. Yeah, with you and deadlines, fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, I don't know if everybody I don't know if everyone knows that uh, Mark has has been now for what ten years the writer on Prince Valiant the comic strip. How did you get that gig? You know, again, Gary G Gary Gianni should be getting ten percent of everything I make because he's got me <laughs> so many jobs. Gary Gianni, uh, after he did the Conan books, was assisting. Uh, John Cullen Murphy, who was the artist at the time, this is the early part of this century, uh, John Cullen Murphy was the artist on, on Prince Valiant. And he was the successor to the original artist, Hal Foster. So you've had three artists on this strip over a period, well, from 1937 on. It's, it's a great deal of continuity on this strip. Now, John Cullen Murphy's son, Cullen Murphy, was writing it. His father decided to retire in about 19, uh, 2003, 2004, and uh, Gary was assuming the reins on the art, but he wasn't interested in writing it himself. So again, much as with Marcello, he, he recommended me to the, uh, to the syndicate who owns Prince Valiant. Um, so I assumed the writing chores when the son decided to retire with his father. And uh, I've been on it ever since, so I guess they're reasonably happy with it. But it's, it's, it's interesting uh, because, again, it's, uh, it's another type of storytelling, working for the papers. It's different from comic books. It's writing, different from writing prose. It's its own animal, and it's, it's, it's fun. It's a great challenge. Is there, is there a daily? I don't see the daily. It's just the Sunday. No, there's no daily of Prince Valiant. It's always been just the Sunday strip. Um, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, uh, but I'm always amazed going back to those original stories that fostered back in the 30s and early 40s, and there were some really similar uh, storytelling structures and elements in there to a number of Howard stories, especially the, uh, the Crusades of Middle Age stories, and, or the um, Middle Eastern stories. So I, I just have to wonder if, if Foster had any touch, or were they were pulling from similar sources. Uh, the, uh, the Shadow of the Vulture, with the, with the, the denouements in the story, with the, the head being sent back to the uh, the pasha, I can't remember who it is, the, uh, <coughs> the Suleiman, right. Um, Howard uses the same ending to his story. Yeah, and, um, even though he knows it's not the right ending, or historical ending. Right, and so I don't know if Howard and he were pulling from similar sources, or if, if Foster was reading Howard's work. Or if they were just breathing the same air. 
It's too similar. There, there's some. There's something there that that was yeah pulling them together. I think. Let's throw it out there. Anybody got any questions for Mark? Please questions. Please. Okay. I ordered something from a new project from, from Amazon, hoping it would be in by this weekend so I could get it signed. Do you have copies of that? Was that still on Group C? I think so. I, I I've got an advanced copy I can show you. Okay, but, but okay. It so it, it's not out. It's still. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Storm to see my latest book he was asking about. It's still on the docks in, uh, there's a, some sort of a labor dispute going on with, in, in California. Okay. My publisher's still waiting for it to be delivered. It should be okay. any day, but I hope to, have, I'd hope to bring him down, yeah, yeah, I know. Um, I, I really enjoy your work a whole lot. Do you, uh, do you work pretty slowly? I mean, do you, do you have to, you have to look at it from a lot of different angles because it's all, you know, it's always so complete and, and tidy and uh, I really admire it. And, uh, Thank you. Yeah. The question was, how do I work and am I a slow worker, a pretty slow worker? No, I'm not a pretty slow worker. I'm an extremely slow worker. <laughs> and I'm always trying to find ways of speeding up my process, but I'm 60 years old now and it hasn't happened yet, so I kind of doubt that it is going to happen. <laughs> But I, I, I'm still, as I'm going to be working in comic format again, which requires an enormous amount of drawing, I'm trying to find methods that, but you're right, my problem is I, I have a tendency to, you know, there's a point that you gotta let a drawing go, or, and, and, or you start to bleed it dry, and sometimes it's hard for some of us to tell when that moment is. And that's a genius, one of the geniuses of Frank Frazetta, was you analyze his work and you can find lots of problems in it, but you don't see that when you first look at it. He knew when to quit. He knew when he had that maximum amount of energy and just the right, just the right amount of detail and the right amount of, uh, of energy in a piece, and he knew when to let it go. And that's, that's the secret to kind of get to that point. And, uh, and I'm always struggling with that. When's the point to quit? But it does tend to make me extremely analytical about my work and uh, slows down the process, yeah. But on the other hand, you know, People seem to like it too, so I'm not, you know, it's what it is. Oh, that's a power mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, be thinking of questions, uh, but I will ask this about uh, working with Conan uh, specifically. <coughs> uh, I'm trying hard to figure out how, to, how I want to formulate this question, but the idea is um, what's it like working with Howard's texts and <coughs> How do you interact with that text as a visual artist? It's interesting. When I was a kid reading Howard, I thought he was so descriptive. I, I just thought he was giving me everything to see these elaborate, wonderful scenes of the ancient world or whatever. Now I reread them as an adult, and someone who's done my own writing and my own illustrating, I find out just how sparse he is in his, his descriptions. But they're spot on descriptions. He gives you the right words and just the right amount of detail to engage your imagination and to think that you're seeing or reading more than you really are. Um, so that, that actually makes him, in, in one regard, very easy to illustrate. The hard part about illustrating his work is there are so many other people, and specifically Frazetta, who has done such a good job and is so identified with his work. And that makes it difficult sometimes. Um, when I was illustrating the Conan stories that I did, I found them, by and large, extremely, the hard part was choosing, you know, just X number of illustrations. You could have done so many. Uh, in, in any illustration job, it's always a priority to find the right moment to illustrate without stealing the thunder of the, of the writer. You don't want to duplicate his um, what am I trying? His his moments, his special, his climaxes, the the points he's trying to make. You kind of lead people in that direction, hopefully, and that's I think a mistake a lot of people make when they're illustrating Lovecraft. They want to show these, you know, tentacles kind of code for Lovecraft now, and you know, I don't. If we see Lovecraft the way he wrote them, our minds would explode. So you don't want to show too much of them. You want to let the the reader engage their imagination and come up with their own worse than you can imagine versions. You let their nightmares get into that. Don't, don't give them too much concrete information. And that's the same with Howard to a certain degree. Uh, you want to keep the horrors in his stuff shadowy and just half seen. 
the only time i really had an issue with with howard's writing and i was trying to figure out how to handle it was i think it's black colossus it was a couple things this is the one i always remember and he writes about conan's forces which were what a core i'm trying to remember the word yeah cloth or something right and they're they're going to battle this the stygian forces and the way he describes them uh conan's forces are are men in in basically uh 14th or 15th or 16th century mounted armor and they're fighting ancient egyptian archers well it would be like us having a sherman tank division going up against 17th century calvary there it would be a massacre on one side there was no balance there so i kind of cheated things out and made his his calvary not uh so much uh the 14th 15th 16th century armor but more of a more of an ancient world armor and then i know some people weren't happy with that but it was just a case where if i think if if howard had thought this through a little more it just wouldn't have added up logically to me it wasn't visually logical so i just cheated that out a little bit but other than that i tried to stay very close to what he wrote and, and honor honor what he wrote Closing Conan, and what like what era did you pick from? Do you pick from to, and what or what do you think in your mind when you think of Conan and what he wears, like in battle? Do you, do you think of fifteenth century medieval, or do you think differently, or is it do you yeah, totally make it up? The question is, what do I think of when I think of clothing uh, Conan? And and yeah, if I do have any to get back to what I said before, if I have any kind of. Uh, uh, gripes with Howard is that his his description of the clothing and the armor and the weapons were so all over the place that again it doesn't add up to a coherent whole and I could I, I could almost skim over that as a reader but when I had to illustrate it I had to think about it too much so I chose the ancient world for the look of Conan. I chose a kind of a oh I'd say early Roman back it's still a cheat it's still centuries and centuries but from early Roman back through oh, Assyrian I guess and I just kind of lumped that all together it's technologically more coherent in my mind how large are your original illustrations how large are my original illustrations well the full page Conan illustrations are about Oh, 11 by 15, I think, inches. And the smaller, I've got a lot of the smaller ones with me that I'll have out uh, later. Did you draw them that big or did you draw them real big and then? No, I draw them, I draw them, I, I do sketches to begin with on, I don't know, eight and a half by 11 paper or something like that. And my process is to work out as many of the drawing problems in pencil uh, that I can. And then I transfer that, well, I scan it into the computer blow it up to the size, I'll do the finish, like 10 by 15 or whatever, and I, I print it out, I light box it, I use a light box, light coating underneath to copy that, that enlarged sketch onto the board that I'll do the finish art on. I redraw it on the finish board and do some more changes and cleaning up and, and I find other drawing problems that I didn't see originally and I correct them. And then once I have that worked out, I'll actually apply ink over the pencils and, and finish it up at the that size at, at 10, 11 by 15. Sure. What about the paintings? The paintings? Well, yeah. the paintings varied in size. Uh, I, and I, I should say, I don't consider myself a painter. I wish I was. My painting technique is more drawing with paint than actually painting. You look at someone like uh, Gary Gianni or, or Greg Manchess, and they're really painting. They're splashing big areas around, and it's loose and it's fun. And my stuff is more uh, just trying to draw it with paint. But I, I did a lot of those paintings at 18 by 24, and some of the others that I think was 11 by 17. favorites of them and what do you think of Margaret Brundage's style and the, that Paul Ferris style and who did, you, who did you like in that era not Frazetta but I mean back in that era. yeah now Scott just asked a very pressing question because this is one of the things I'm going to be talking about in my uh, 
at the dinner tonight that I'm going to be talking about is uh, what uh, the earlier Weird Tales artist uh, that illustrated Howard, Who Do I Like? And, and you, you mentioned Margaret Brundage, and I do like her. She, I like her because I admire what she did. Uh, Weird Tales was a hard sell magazine. It was hard to get a decent readership for these stories that were a cut above, I think, and a little more in depth than the average pulp magazine. But she did a great job of always finding you know, the, the girl, the damsel in distress part of that, and she was great at doing these women in distress type of, of, uh, of uh, cover illustrations that got the public's attention, that sold magazines. And there's a great deal of value, and again, getting back to Frazetta, these are the people that drag readers that don't, aren't gonna pick up the book otherwise. They're not gonna read Robert E. Howard otherwise, but, oh, wow, there's a half-naked woman being mentioned by a monster. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this a try. So there's a great deal of value in that, and she was very good at that, so I admire her a great deal. But the guy, I think, that is underlooked, and I wish I knew more about him, I know that E. Hoffman probably should write about him, and I wish there was more of his work available, is uh, the interior illustrator Hugh Rankin, who was brilliant. He's not, I think, popular today, because he doesn't do what we conceive of as the, the hyper-muscular barbarian look, he was more of a mood artist who caught the creepy horror in, in Howard's stuff, as well as in Lovecraft and in other writings. But he was a wonderfully technically brilliant uh, uh, charcoal and, and, and Russian ink artist who I, I think just captured that spirit, that creepy side of, of the story so well. And that was the side that, of course, Weird Tales was interested in, uh, the horror aspect. So I would say Hugh Rankin, for me, is heads and shoulders and heads above all the other illustrators from Weird Tales. That did Howard. There was someone way in the back. Yes. Yeah, in, in the speaking of this time, you know, referencing Frazetta, um, you just said who do you love is a question for Howard. When I was 16 years old, I, I probably would have read Howard if I didn't feel Frazetta was part of it. And just so friendly, I was developing this kind of love that Um, the question is, do I think there's going to be another illustrator who will transcend Frazetta? And I guess you're saying in regard to this type of subject matter. <coughs> right. Um, yeah, that's the question. And again, I talk about this a little bit. I don't know if I'm going to need to give my talk tonight. I'm covering some. <laughs> uh, uh, that's a good question. Frazetta does something so specifically well, which is to capture that brute, uh, that brute force in Howard's work. I don't know if anyone's ever going to do that better. There are people who do different better variations on it. I don't know if there'll be anyone who'll ever do that better, but I don't think we've seen the, the artist, because I, again, I'll get into this later, but the fact that he isn't accepted yet in a broader, I think he's a great American writer, and I think eventually we're going to come to accept them like Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett have been accepted in a broader uh, arena as important American writers. I believe, I'm maybe an optimist, but I believe that that's going to come for Howard. And I think at that point, you're going to see a much broader arena of illustrators who are going to attack Howard's work. And I think we're going to see things out of that that just may surpass for capturing, uh, again, the, 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 the the full sweep of what Howard uh, was bringing to the table. I think that person is down the road yet. As our culture changes and accepts this stuff, I think, you know, so will the illustrations that uh, accompany the work. That's my hope, anyway. Do you, uh, do you make and use props in your uh, illustrations? Do I make and use props? Boy, I wish I did. I keep saying I'm going to do sculptings of my characters and stuff, I never do. <coughs> Take a ton of photographs, do a ton of reference work. I use models, like human models, and take photographs and stuff, but uh, no, I, I haven't yet done any prop work. Anyone else? Did you do in, in um, 
dinosaur physiology before you started doing data modeling? How much uh, actual research I do in actual dinosaur physiology? Um, not a great deal. I, I keep up with it, and I have uh, friends in paleontology, and I've worked with them executing uh, uh, recreations of actual fossil evidence and stuff, so I, I can do that with guidance. But when I do dinosaurs for stories, I want dinosaurs that are effective, dramatic tools, and I don't let reality you know, interfere too much with what I want to get across dinosaurs as in a story. I want them to work dramatically, so I'll, I'll certainly veer far away from what we know to be, be true. You catch a lot of flack in the beginning for using your imagination so much in your drawings. Did I catch flack for using my imagination in drawings? Yeah, you really... Well, my mother wished I was doing covered bridges and seashores. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but beyond that, no, I don't think I've ever gotten any negative. Yeah, I don't think, in, in this line of work, you can't go too far wrong with your imagination. As long as, here's what I will say about that, and I am very careful about this, is if you're asking people to accept fantastic elements, and this is my belief, whether you're writing or drawing, you've got to have a strong grounding in what people know to be reality. You've got to make them believe what you're doing so when you throw in that fantastic element, they will buy in because the rest of it seems real to them, you know. You, you don't, uh, I have trouble with a lot of fantasy storytelling, which is all elves and dragons and on and on. And it's like, well, there's nothing here that really relates to the world I know. And that's one reason I love Howard. He, uh, he pulled from historical fiction and, you know, he, he added uh, elements that were fantastic to a pretty strong grounding and understanding history and culture. And he didn't get it right all the time, but there's enough there to make me buy into it. And I try to remember that when I do my work. Kind of taking off the dinosaur physiology question, uh, how close do you try to stick to the actual Cadillac and how much of this do you go to oh. the oh. How close do I stick to the uh, Cadillacs and the cars I put in my... Uh, yeah, they're, they're a son of a god. Boy, I never would have included them if I knew how difficult it was going to be to draw. <laughs> it's tough to do straight lines or perspective on cars and keep it consistent. I, I'm pretty close to that. I do, these are customized vehicles that I put in my stories, but the bodies are pretty close. I've got a nice model of a, a couple different models of a 54 Cadillac I use over and over in El Dorado. And it's a, it's a great, beautiful vehicle. I think for, a, you know what, for me that's the high point of American industrial design is the cars of like from 49 through 54. And then they started to go over the top. I mean, that's my personal. I see some people nodding their heads. They probably know more cars about than I do. But um, yeah, that's my favorite period. And that 54 Caddy is just about, in my mind, top of the line. There's some others like the uh, Packard Caribbean that are from that same area and the, uh, the era rather and the Buick 88, uh, Rocket 88. And, um, What's the other one I've used before? The, the Hudson Hornet, of course, is great, but it's from that same period and that streamlined look that just, it's just good design, you know. Which gives me a chance to real quickly put in a plug for the Barbarian Festival tomorrow because they usually have some really cool old cars out there. Oh, good. <laughs> Bill. Oh, oh. Sorry, uh, Bill, you go ahead. He said, go ahead. Well, yeah, in, in, in my writing Prince Valiant, how closely do I follow what's previously been written? We try to follow closely, but the fact is, again, since 1937, well over, what's that, over 75 years, it's hard to know everything. And, 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 and actually, the writers in the past, the, the previous administration, did write some dead ends that we danced around. So we try to stay very aware and stay as close as possible. But again, we're telling we're not trying to, we're not telling history here. We're, we're, it's a dramatic story that has a lot of historical elements. So the, the bottom line is telling a good story, hopefully a compelling story. So if we need to, we'll cheat things out, you know? But as little as possible.
my own perception has been um, the Valiant's stories are livelier when he's not at Camelot <laughs> than when he is. Is that yours too? Yeah, the, uh, again, with a character that's been around as long as Camelot, he's built up a family, and boy, that's a lot of characters. He's got five kids and a wife and all these friends at Camelot, and they just, it's easy to get sucked into the idea that this is about everyone, but the name of the strip is Prince Valiant, and the best stories are when you get him away from all the other people, and he's got to live by his wits again. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of the goal of balancing both because on the other hand, the readership for Sunday strips, they like family strips. So you do want to have the family in there, but it is harder to write that and keep it interesting. And, and you know, coming from the kind of works that I like, of course I like them swinging a sword around better than babysitting, you know. <laughs> Bill, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, for all the artists in the, in the crowd, what, uh, technically, what kind of Material do you like to work with? What kind of pencils? What kind of brushes? Oh, ink, ink, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So Bill's asking what kind of materials I like to work with and tools and, and media. I paper and stuff too. Paper. Okay. Well, it's pretty standard stuff. It comes out of my work in comics, but Strathmore 500 Bristol board, which is 100% cotton, and I like that because you can erase into it and beat it up, and it still stays strong. That's the paper I generally use for almost all my illustration work. Um, I use ink as I use ink as my primary. That's my number one media, and uh, ink is pretty crappy these days. It's hard to get good ink. And I just use Higgins because I water down my ink. If I was looking for real, real black inks, I'd go with something that does it. There's a Talons out of Europe is really in fact that's used for tattoo ink, and that's so that's really strong stuff and it's good. But I water down my ink, so I just use Higgins regular. Not the black magic stuff, just the regular stuff. And then the brush I use is a, it's again, the industry standard, the Windsor Newton Series 7, number two or three, which is great. You can get wonderful fine line work and just turn it on its side and just whack in big, black, splashy areas. And it does a lot of, it's a tool that has a lot of variation. I love the brush. And then I also work, I do illustration work in watercolor and uh, I build up a carbon pencil over that which is a uh, carbon pencil is a great medium that's it's big, big illustration tool in the early 20th century before uh, color reproduction was feasible. It was very expensive, so there's a lot more black and white illustration. And carbon pencil is a combination of graphite and charcoal. And it gives you kind of the control of graphite, but it's got that nice velvety black thing that you get from charcoal without that reflective thing happening, you know, the shiny surface from graphite. So I use a lot of that if I'm doing more tonal pieces. I'll put down, uh, I'll establish either color or, or monochrome uh, uh, watercolor underneath, and then I'll build up and complete the drawing with a uh, carbon pencil, which that, the gray of the carbon pencil kind of unifies the colors sometimes, it's nice. But I'll also just work in pure watercolor and occasionally oils, but mostly my, those are my big mediums. Yes, sir, question? Um, there wasn't a lot for what I was particularly interested in when I was a kid. There's a lot more now. But if for anatomy, if you look at uh, you know, kind of the standard text that Dover always has these in print, uh, the Bridgman books for anatomy. And they're good for, again, illustration and for, for like an expressive, action-oriented anatomy. And uh, I'm drawing a blank on his name. I'll think later. But, but Bridgman is a good place to start, George Bridgman. Excuse me? Nicolaides. No, he's good too, though. But um, Loomis. And Loomis, and thank you. Loomis, Loomis. Yeah, Loomis. yes, he's great for anatomy. And you can, those books have all been reprinted recently. I think Titan did those, I'm not sure. Titan. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and, 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 and but the, uh, with the internet, you know, you can just find so much. It's, it's great, it's a great tool. And, and draw as much, if you're interested in this, draw as much of life as you can, no matter what your goal is, how cartoons or how fantastic you want. You get a good grounding of what people and the world really looks like.
looks like. I mean, that was Frazetta's grounding, and he took it in his own direction, but you need to understand how people really work and are really put together, how the mechanics of the human body works, or of anything. You know, in our whole world, everything is based on human proportions. Uh, it has to work, all our architecture, our cars, everything has to work with the human, the human uh, size and form, so it's, the human body is a good place to start. Do I have a particular favorite project that I've worked on? Well, because it's my own baby, Zenozoic Tales, you know, it's, it's, it's the thing that's closest to my heart, so it would have to be that. But, but you know, the great thing about this job is there's so many different, you know, I get so many different great opportunities to work on. I mean, Howard, I've worked with Burroughs' work, I mean, I've written Superman, it's been all over the map, and it's great. I get paid to say a kid. <laughs> So the question is, what's my response to the exaggerated, the hyper-exaggerated muscularity that's kind of uh, the norm for uh, gaming and, and comics these days? Um, well, it's not my thing, so, uh, but I try to keep an open mind. I teach, and, and so I realize that there's just a lot of interest in that. That's just kind of culturally the thing that, a lot of, that brings a lot of kids into, a lot of males anyway, into comics and into gaming and, and, and we even see that in the motion pictures. You look at action heroes these days. Uh, it's what it is, you know, and I hope it's a phase that we go through, but uh, it is what it is. You just accept it and you move on. I'm lucky that I can do my thing that doesn't get too involved with that. Uh, but I've been, I've been around, again, I've seen so many different phases of things come and go. Um, yeah, there's nothing you can do to fight it. You just have to work with it, except that's what it is. And, and, and I try to guide kids to look at other things and not accept that this has to be the way it is. You just don't do that look because your favorite artist is doing that when you're 10 years old. You use that as a jumping up, off point to figure out where it came from, to look back at history where the influences that person were and who were the influences of that earlier person and, and just have a greater understanding of all the possibilities. And that's where true creativity comes from. You know, you use what you're seeing then as a jumping off point, and you, uh, you, uh, you know, you look at other influences and you combine things in different ways. Do you ever get to work on personal stuff like covered bridges and seascapes? <laughs> do I ever? <laughs> do, I, do I make my mom proud? Yeah. Do I work on my own? My personal projects are, are, are writing my own stories and, and illustrating them. We're doing comic work. That's sort of my head. So, and you know what? I'm embarrassed to say I keep for years and I got to get back outside and do plain air painting. Get outside and get this drawing. The natural world, which would be a great boon, it would, it would lead me in different directions and help me grow as an artist, but it's just finding the time. And someday I'm going to do that, but I haven't yet. Scott? If you had mentioned Edgar Rice Burroughs, like which, which series is your favorite and which would you like to draw? I mean, if you had a chance, if someone said you can draw the covers for it. Well, if I could do one uh, illustration series for an Edgar Rice Burroughs, it would probably be At the Earth's Core for those <coughs> prehistoric stuff and but you know you, it's hard to go wrong with the Martian stuff the Barson stuff it's, it's all great yeah and and you know the lot the uh, the uh, cast back stories what's that the uh, land of time for God stuff is all great too and you know I did some illustration for the moon maid and, and that's not that's under illustrate that's great stuff a lot of great visual stuff in that is, yes. there, is there a project out there that you've heard of and you're waiting to that I've just heard of, a project that I've just heard of that I'd like to do? Mm -hmm. uh, I can't think of anything offhand. There's so much stuff from years ago that I'd like to do. There's such a backlog of stuff that I'd like to get to. I'm sure there are things out there that would be exciting to do, but I can't think of anything in particular offhand. Do you ever rework a piece that you've done? I'm 
few years ago. Do I ever rework pieces? Rosetta did that. Yeah, too. and I got to see him doing some of that, and it wasn't pretty. <laughs> it was unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I haven't done that yet. I hope I don't get to that point. But I mean, he was doing it for therapeutic reasons. Okay. And, and that was fine. But it was also sad to see something that had a certain degree of energy. Again, I was talking earlier about overworking a piece. And that's unfortunately what I saw happening with some of Rosetta's work. It was, he was for therapeutic reason again to, to help him get over his stroke. Uh, you know, he can get more hand-eye coordination in his other hand. He was working into old pieces, and it was unfortunately it was not helping. Yeah. Okay, so don't do that. I would resist attempt. Move on, do new pieces. Forget the old yeah. pieces. Yeah, he, just don't be precious about them. Move on to new things. More on the literature side than the illustration side. This uh, Worms of the Earth issue you brought with you, that's a reissue of an 80s um, mm -hmm. comic, right? Yes. Um, I read an interview where you said that the first time you did it, you thought you might have tried to put too much detail into it and that it was weighed down in places. I, I'm not sure. Was, was that you? I did the cover for that. That was the cover. Only, yeah. No, I, meant, I meant the actual. No, the illustrations inside. Oh, those no, that weren't mine. Okay, yeah. that yeah. was Barry me. Smith and Tim mm -hmm. Conrad. Tim, right. right. Did Barry Smith started that and Tim Conrad Tim finished Conrad. it? Oh. Yeah. 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 No, that wasn't that wasn't my work. But I, I can certainly uh, I can certainly sympathize with that. I certainly yeah, I, I read some interview with him where he was saying that had he didn't do it over again, he would have kept it simpler. Yeah, I think a lot of us feel that way. Yeah. It's it's an excellent comic though. Yeah, it is. It certainly is. Someone? Anyone? Okay. We got someone back there. Oh, okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the publisher that you're working with, Lex, and, and how that came about? I wasn't, I wasn't at all familiar with him as a publisher until your stuff started coming out through them, and I'm kind of curious how that came about, and what, what type of publishing has been on overall time that you're working on? Well, the question was about my publisher, plus publications, and just a little bit about backstory on them. And um, it's a small uh, company out of the West Coast, out of California. And essentially, it's one person, John Pleskis. He's a really cool guy. He's a, he was a championship surfer, skimboard surfer, uh, out of Santa Cruz. And he's, he's just one of these guys. He never went to college. But he just decides what he wants to learn and what he wants to do, and he does it. And he decided at the age of 30 that he was tired of working for Sun Microsoft, and he wanted to start a publishing company. So he learned how to publish and learned how to design on the computer. Amazing, yeah, just completely fearless. But uh, uh, they, he started, right before he started working with me, his first couple of books were reprints of classic illustrators, Franklin Booth and, uh, and Joseph Clement Cole. And uh, I, I met him early on. I met him at the Wandering Star table, actually. He was pushing some of his work there. We gave him permission to, to be at the table. And uh, I asked him uh, if you had a chance to work with any contemporary illustrators, who would you like to work with? And he, he's being very diplomatic, and he said, well, you. I said, oh, OK, I'm not going to say no to that. So we had a great relationship. He, he's growing an empire now. You know, he's taken over the spectrum of uh, illustration uh, uh, competitions and books. And uh, he's got, uh, I, I was his top contemporary artist for a while, and now he's got a whole array of people he's working for. And he's going through some growing pains. You know, he's adding on employees now and, and, and growing. But uh, I think the cool thing about Pless, and I'm glad, I, I, if I'm smart about anything in business, it's that I got on board with a growing trend, I think, in publication. I, I think the day of the big mainstream publishers centered in New York or Chicago or Los Angeles it's over. It's just not a business that will sustain itself as a general market, you know, hit all the bases of readership uh, type of business anymore. It's just too expensive and the returns are too low. I think the future in publishing is in small publishers that have relatively low overhead that hit niche markets. And from my experience in publishing, that's the future. And John Flesk was a little ahead of the curve on that. I think we're going to see more people that uh, address the type of works that we're interested in <coughs> and coming from smaller uh, publishers, publishers that, that target specific market, the specific market that we're interested in. Who are some of your favorite?
comic book artists? Who are some of my favorite comic book artists? Well, the guy who made me want to be a comic book artist is Wally Wood. Okay. And Wally Wood, of course, I picked up from uh, a lot of his influence has to do with guys like Alex Ringman and Hal Foster, who did the classic American adventure strips. And contemporaries of Wally Woods like Al Williamson. Okay. Uh, so those are those are the main those are the main culprits. Roy Crane, Texan, who did uh, Buzz Sawyer, great storyteller, underlooked yeah. overlooked yeah. storyteller. Mm -hmm. Do you want to wrap it up and take kind of a break? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone.